Hey class, great meeting you all today. Um, this is our first lecture in lead in the environment. And I'm going to stick mostly with chemistry today, a little bit of history. This is the background you need. We're going to try to keep it really simple um, before we launch into the uses of lead and then the hazards of lead and how to sample for lead. So let's start with lead the element. And you're going to dig back a little bit into the chemistry classes you all have had, maybe in high school, maybe in college. Um, and first thing we think about is where's the name come from? Turns out it's an Anglo-Saxon word, that is lead. But the symbol is PB, which has nothing to do with lead until you go back to the Latin and realize that it's the Latin word for waterworks or piping, plumbum. We carry that into English today with plumbers, right? And PB is the abbreviation in the periodic table for lead. So as you can see, I put that out here. Um, lead also has the number 82 associated with it and a mass of 207.2. And let me explain what's going on there. But first, let's have a look at this plumbum. Uh, and that comes from the piping in Roman times. So that picture that you see over here on the left side of your screen, that's a lead pipe in England, in the town of Bath, England, which was settled by the Romans. Um, and these were thermal baths, um, places where the Romans would go to sit and have a hot soak, and the, and the water was carried in these lead pipes. Why lead for piping? Because it's really soft metal and it's really easy to form into pipes. So what the Romans would do is they would take a sheet of lead that was easy to hammer out, they would roll it together and they would solder the joint at the top. And you can see that solder joint here. And then they would join the lead pipes together with more solder. Here's a piece of that pipe with some Latin impressed on the side here. Here's the seam on there. So lead's really special because it's a very easily worked metal. It's very soft. Um, and so in earlier times, that was something you could do to, to create piping networks. It was also used in coins. So here's a Roman lead coin here. Um, we think of lead as sort of a silvery gray material, but when it encounters oxygen in the atmosphere, just like iron rusts and turns red, um, lead actually uh, gets an oxide coating. It combines with oxygen in the atmosphere and that becomes white on the surface. So both this piece of lead here has an oxide coating on it and this coin. The pipe here does not. You might think about why. Um, my guess there is looking at those polished stones, it's people's feet. Enough tourists have walked over and over and over that, that they essentially rub that oxide coating off. All right, so what is lead? Lead's a metal. It's a silvery gray metal. Here's a picture of um, some lead up here from a site that actually sells lead. Um, it conducts electricity because it's a metal. It's very, very dense, about 11 times the density of water. So you would have a really hard time picking up a gallon worth of lead, but it's pretty easy to pick up a gallon worth of water. Typically gray to silver, but when it gets oxidized, when it's combined with oxygen, it can be red, it can be white, and it can be yellow. So up here is some red lead oxide powder up here. There it is, right there, bright red. Um, lead's also toxic, but we'll get to that. That's, that's not for today. All right, dig deep into your chemistry. This is a periodic table here. Um, and can you find lead? If you look, it's in the lower right section of the periodic table. And remember, the periodic table is arranged so that the lightest elements, those with the fewest protons, are up at the top. Those with the most protons are down at the bottom. Um, and as you go from the left side of the periodic table to the right side of the periodic table here, um, you go up in the number of protons as long as you stay in one of these rows. Uh, and as you go down a column here, um, the elements tend to have similar chemical um, behavior. So for instance, these are all these noble gases that don't react with anything. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Lead is 82. It's down here in this bottom right corner. And that means that all lead has 82 protons in its nucleus. And we're going to come, come back to that. But this is where you find lead down in that corner on the periodic table. And so those of you who don't remember your chemistry or perhaps never had it, periodic table is a way to organize what we know about elements. Uh, all, these are all the elements that either are natural or have been created by people. So it's a way of chemical organization. This is a much more fun periodic table. 
Um, this has been put together um, by a man who's published a fantastic book. If we were all in person, I would toss that book on the table in the classroom. Um, it's a glossy, large book that has a couple pages dedicated to every element here in the periodic table. And what he's done, his name is Ted Gray, um, is he's collected photographs and stories and bits and pieces about all these elements. So this is his periodic table on here. Um, and we'll go back down to lead here, which is 82, and he's got a picture of a lead pipe. And you can get to that poster that I've got here with this URL here if you want to look at it. But it's really fascinating if you're interested in elements. Uh, for instance, here's hydrogen. That's a nebula uh, off in the solar system. And here's the noble gases in, in neon lights and like that here. There's oxygen, things that we deal with every day. Um, but it's just a really fantastic piece of work that he's put together here. All right, so there's 82. Let's have a look at lead. Um, I really encourage you to check out the reading for today. In fact, we're going to go have a look at it. This is um, Gray's page on lead. And we'll go back here again. Here's that joint, palming joint. Here's the symbol PB for lead, for plumbum. Lead has 82 protons. I'm going to keep coming back to that. 82 protons in the nucleus, in the center of lead. But it has a total mass of that nucleus of 207. And, and I'll show you in the next couple slides why that is. With such a high atomic weight, it turns out to be quite dense. I said a little bit more than 11 times the density of water. It has a rather low melting point. This is pretty easy to melt lead. It's one of the reasons that many early societies used it. It's got a pretty high boiling point. So um, 327 Celsius. Remember, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So in, a, in an open fire, one can melt lead. So let's go and explore this website, because I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, this is the, the website for lead here um, that he's got, and there's lots of different information buried in here. So one of the first things you can do is just curse down and you can look at all these photographs of various leaded objects. So here's some battery plates inside a car battery. So I could make that image larger by clicking on it. I could see those plates. Here's the terminal on the car battery. Um, I could spin this around so I could see it in three dimensions. Pretty cool. Like that, I could make it larger, so I can see the whole object spinning there, like this. And I could look at all the different objects that he's got. So I'll back up here and look at these different objects, and there are many, many, many of them here. Um, so this is a Roman sling bullet from 2,000 years ago. Um, here's a Napoleonic rifle bullet. Here's a pipe that somebody might have smoked something in. Um, a reamer to ream out lead pipes. A block of lead that you could have bought at the hardware store. A bullet from the Civil War. Um, this is a detector for a crystal radio. It has a bit of galena in it, which is a, a lead mineral we'll talk about next class. Here's leaded crystal. So people put lead in glass to make the glass very heavy and to, to shine in an interesting way. Um, BB gun pellets made of lead here. Uh, bags of lead shot for, for hunting. Uh, lead as a, a way to protect against radioactive isotopes because it's so dense it absorbs radiation. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, printing blocks. So before we think today of you know laying out on our computer, when printing was done by hand, lead was used here actually for printing. So there's lots of really good things in here that you should have a look at. Um, I'm not going to go through them all now. I'll let you let you have a look. Um, but we'll talk about the uses of lead next time, and we'll certainly revisit some of these. But what's really interesting up here is you can look at some particularly technical data about lead. And so if you want to understand lead's characteristics, these are a lot of the technical data for lead. So it's density, it's atomic weight, it's number, it's symbol, it's melting point. Some various thermal properties. Those of you who are engineers will, will certainly appreciate and understand some of these. Um, there are other properties like the way it strains uh, these different moduli that are here. Hardness. Lead turns out to be really, really soft. Um, the speed of sound in lead. This is everything you might ever want to know about lead. Um, because I'm more of a chemist than I am an engineer, I'm really interested in some of the nuclear properties of lead here. And for instance, um, there are four stable isotopes of lead that aren't radioactive. 204, 206, 207, and 208. Um, all the rest of these lead isotopes, in fact, are radioactive. They're not stable on there. 
Uh, so let's let's go back now and, and have a look. We'll talk about what it means to be an isotope here of lead. I close this up. Okay. And I do suggest you have a look at that website that is assigned, is assigned for today. It's just a really fun read. So let's go back to the model of an atom. And I realize I'm probably taking you way back into, into chemistry if you haven't had this recently. But this is an atom of nitrogen, which is the most common gas in our atmosphere. This is the nucleus of nitrogen. And in that nucleus are seven protons and seven neutrons. There are also seven electrons orbiting that nucleus. Now remember, a proton has a charge of one and a mass of one. And a neutron has a mass of one, but really no charge. So this nitrogen atom is balanced. It has the same amount of negative electrons as positive protons, and it has seven extra neutrons in there. So while the atomic number for nitrogen is seven, because that's the number of protons in the nucleus, the atomic mass for nitrogen, which is protons plus neutrons, is 14. So when we look at the periodic table, nitrogen is going to be in the seventh position because it has seven protons, and its mass is going to be around 14. So we can compare that to lead, which is really different. Lead has 82 protons in the nucleus, and the most common isotope of lead has 126 neutrons. If we add those two together, we're going to get lead 208. 82 plus 126, and here's lead 208, the most common isotope. There are these three other stable isotopes, not radioactive, 207, 206, and 204, and they have just fewer neutrons. And then there's this whole slew of isotopes of lead that are radioactive that have even fewer neutrons in here. So the takeaway from this is that all lead has the atomic number of 82. That's how we define it as lead. Lead isotopes have different numbers of neutrons. The lead that we're interested in for this class is either 204, 206, 207, or 208. Why am I bothering to teach you this? Because it's a really cool way to tell where your lead came from. Natural lead deposits have different amounts of these four lead isotopes in them. And so that can be used as a tracer, as a fingerprinter, sort of as a forensic piece to figure out where lead has come from. Could be useful to trace it in someone's body, could be useful to trace it as contamination, but it's a really useful way to trace. And we'll come back to that later in this class. So a lot of the lead that we deal with day to day is actually the result of radioactive decay. You're probably familiar with uranium. Um, uranium is used in nuclear power plants. Uranium is used in weapons, uh, in nuclear bombs, fission bombs. Um, and there are many isotopes of uranium, but I picked one, which is uranium-238 here. It's a natural, uh, element, a natural uranium isotope. And it has a very long, what we call, decay chain. So it also has a really long half-life, four and a half billion years, about the age of the Earth. So about half of the uranium-238 that was there at the age of the Earth, uh, when they were started, is still there. The other half of it's gone. It decays from uranium to thorium, palladium, uranium, back to thorium, radium, radon, and polonium, and to a radioactive isotope of lead here, and then bismuth, and then back to polonium, and then to lead 210, another radioactive lead isotope, and then back to bismuth and another polonium, and bingo, at the end, finally ends up at lead 206. Don't worry, I can't keep any of this in my head, and I work a lot with things like lead 210 on here. The reason to tell you this is that some of this lead that we have today started out a long time ago as uranium in there and has now become lead. The lead that was used to paint your house, again, it's not radioactive. It's one of those four stable isotopes. So lead, turns out, is actually pretty rare in nature. Um, except in specific minerals and specific deposits. And I'll get to that in the next lecture. But I pulled up this map, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I wanted to show where lead was found mostly in the United States. And it's something in a deposit called a Mississippi Valley type deposit. Again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that next time. Um, it's not in Mississippi, though. Most of the lead is in Arkansas and Missouri and even further north. So these gray dots here, 
indicate places where there are lead and zinc and silver or combined lead zinc silver mines and you see some up in the north here in Iowa and you see a whole bunch in Missouri my dad grew up in St. Louis right there so I know a little bit about that part of the world but this is where most of the lead mining in the US goes on get down to Mississippi here not much in the way of mining here a little bit of iron uh, mined here a little bit of uranium actually um, there's a green dot here and we come up to Vermont where we are and in fact um, there's some uranium mining up here in Vermont there was a lot of copper mining a lot of iron mining a um, little bit in the eastern side of the state over here of lead one of those is actually a um, super fun site right now and over here in western New York definitely some lead mining out there western New York um, so these are places where lead is concentrated, but it's otherwise quite rare in nature. So I want to introduce a unit that some of you probably understand and are familiar with, and some of you probably aren't. And that's a unit called a part per billion or a PPB. And in this class, we're going to be working in PPB. We're also going to be working in PPM, where PPM is part per million. But I thought today I would start with PPB. These are really hard units to understand. What's one part in a billion right so there are seven billion people on our planet right now a part per billion be one out of a billion so seven people on our entire planet it's really rare when you have a part per billion a part per million on the other hand is one out of a million there are 300 million people in the u.s so it would be 300 people out of the u.s population still pretty small so i looked up some analogies here these actually come off the NOAA website a part per billion is a drop of ink in the largest tanker truck used to haul gasoline. Think about those big trucks you see hauling gasoline. Or, and I love this one, it's one sheet in a roll of toilet paper stretching from New York to London. Not that we can get much toilet paper these days. Or one pinch of salt in 10 tons of potato chips. That just makes my stomach hurt. Or one second in 32 years. So that's second and three quarters out of the whole time I've been in my life that's not very long so a part per billion is a really really small amount so let's look at how much lead is typically found in different places so if we go to the universe it's about 10 parts per billion of lead the sun 10 parts per billion a meteorite should one happen to fall in your backyard never happened to me 1400 parts per billion the average crustal rock the average rock you pick up outside is going to have about 10,000 parts per billion. Now remember, a billion is a thousand times a million. So if you converted the crustal rocks from 10,000 ppb to ppm, it'd be about 10 parts per million. So when we do our lead analysis and we find 10, 20, 30 parts per million, that's just kind of average. That's not what people necessarily have added. That's just what's out there. Seawater has almost no lead. It does not dissolve well in seawater. Stream water, maybe three parts per billion. Um, humans, 1,700 parts per billion. A lot of that is probably because humans are encountering environmental lead and concentrating it in their bodies. Like that. So this just gives you a feeling. Remember, let's go back. Part per billion is really rare. The one sheet in the roll of toilet paper stretching all the way from New York to London, right? Or the drop of ink in a tanker truck. All right, let me do a quick summary of what we've done. Um, I want you to remember that lead is really rare stuff in nature, except where it's not. And where it's not is in natural lead deposits in, in places where people have put lead. And we're going to spend this next two weeks talking about where people have put lead. All of that derived from natural lead deposits where it had been mined. Atomic number for lead is 82. That means it has 82 protons in its nucleus. Atomic weight is much higher. It's 207. That means there are a lot of neutrons mixed in with those protons in the nucleus. It has a really low melting point, 300 degrees Celsius on there. You can melt it over a fire. That made it easy to smelt. And again, next time I'll talk a bit about the Roman smelting. In fact, we know when and where the Romans were smelting in part because of lead that's preserved in the Greenland ice sheet. Pretty cool story. Boiling point for lead is really high, but why would you want to boil lead? And important here, lead is really, really dense. And that's one of its uses. Because it's so dense, it absorbs things like radiation. It's 11 times denser than water, and it's a solid at room temperature. 
as are the lead oxides. And those lead oxides are what are used in paints. Remember, that's lead that's been combined with oxygen. So we'll come back to that lead oxide. All right, I want to go um, through the assignment for today. Um, in some detail, we're going to try to do this at the end of every lecture we do to remind you what needs to be done. The first thing for today, please read the syllabus. Um, it might take you 10 minutes. It will explain everything. It's really worth the read. Can't tell you how many times I've taught classes where students haven't taken the, the time to read the syllabus at the beginning, and it just it sets you behind from day one. So take time to read that syllabus. Um, read the web page assigned for today. I've walked you through it briefly, but I just think you're going to have fun with it. It's a great web page. Um, after you've done that, after you've listened to this assignment, um, take the quiz on Blackboard after watching this class. It's going to be a really short, quick quiz on the basic things we touched on in the class today. What I expect you to take more time on is creating a website for the class. And we're going to do this on Google Sites. Don't worry if you're having trouble. Both of us will be online tomorrow to help you out there. There's plenty of videos on YouTube for making Google Sites. Um, it's a really easy program to use once you get into it. Occasionally you get stuck, and that's where Google's your friend. We're going to ask you to make three pages in total tomorrow. First page is a landing page or a main page. That'll have a title, short description of what it's about, and your name and the links to other pages. Feel free to put some photos on there related to lead, but this will be the lead page for your portfolio. So it probably should have the word lead in it. It might have your, it'll definitely have your name on it. It might have a photograph or something related to lead. Then you're going to start making linked pages. So number two is a linked page introducing yourself with a video or an audio or a text description. I love the idea if you guys are willing to do it of a video because I think it makes it easier to get to know folks. We missed a couple people today on our meeting, and so if you can make a video, that's great on there. Um, and the third one is to link a page. You might title it All About Lead. I don't really care what you title it about, but it's a page where you describe the element lead, so what you've learned today in this lecture, or what you additional things you may have learned by looking up things about lead. And then I want you to put two objects in there um, where lead is still used today. The website that you read today could really help you with that. Try to pick some objects that are, you're familiar with or you found interesting. Um, and Include the photographs or sketches of these objects with a caption explaining them, and always put the proper attribution. So you'll notice, I'm going to back up here for a minute, that every time I put an image in my slide here, I copy the URL from which it came. And to me, that's just a really important thing to say, hey, this came from somebody. I'm acknowledging the fact that they did the work. So it's giving credit where credit's due. Last thing's really important here. Um, send your, over, your overall site URL to me and to Nico. Um, that's the site that Google, what, what Google calls the site there. Um, for instance, I have Grace's down here, um, and it always starts with HTTPS sites, google.com, view, and then um, she titled it Lead in the Environment 2020, and it's her homepage. I'll show you how to find that when we click in here, um, but that's what you want to send to us because we're going to link it to our page. So lastly, let's go have a look at Grace's. It's a good example. She did this one today. Okay, so that's that's my site right here um, for the class. And then I'm going to go find Grace's by clicking here on Student Portfolios. And hopefully by tomorrow, everybody's site will be up here. We can all look at them. So there's Grace. I'm going to click on there. And this is her Lead in the Environment class site. So she's got a title she put in up here. She's got a big title here. Um, she doesn't have any photos or description yet, but hopefully she'll get those in there tomorrow. And then she's got an about the author. So if I go up here, I can find about the author. And this is about Grace. Um, she's written a little history of herself, um, her name. She's a rising senior. She's doing microbiology. This is where her family lives. She's got some pictures of her hermit crabs on here. This is great. So we've learned something about Grace here. It'd be great, Grace, if you're willing to toss a picture up there or a short video of you talking so um, that we know who you are. So this is a great introduction. Um, and the way to find the name of her site, let's do this, go back here, is to go up to the top here and simply click there. So that's Grace's home site right here. So you guys can pull that for your site and send it to me. There is another way to get at this. Let me pop in there. So if you're in your own site like this, this is the class site that I've got. It's going to take a minute to load. So you're editing your site. You've got everything the way you like it. 
you can go up to this little button here that says copy published site link. If you click on it, here's that site link. I copy it and that's the class website right now. So if I open up a new window and I paste in what I just copied, there's the site. So if you send that to us, then we'll be able to put the link in under student portfolios and your name will go from black to blue and it'll be a live link and everybody else can have a look at it. All right. So that's it for us for lecture one. Um, work on your assignments. Again, Nico and I will be on email tomorrow. We will send you a note soon saying when we will be on office hours. We'll be on Teams, but you can try us by cell phone. You can try us by calling on Teams um, and we can help you work through things if you're having any trouble. Please, all during this class, feel free to contact either of us. We're here to help you and we'd like to get to know you. So have a good day and get in touch if you've got any questions.